If you're like me, you might hear estate planning and go, ugh, gross. You might think to yourself, I'm not sure why I'd bother with that. Estate planning is only for the uber rich. Tallgrass begs to differ. Tallgrass founding attorneys Laurel and Riley think everyone should have an estate plan. They know estate planning seems untouchable to a lot of folks, like something you have to do inside a stuffy law firm of stuffy McLawyer Pants Esquire. But I promise you, Tallgrass is nothing like that. For one, they work out of their home so their clients can feel at home. They obsess because they're nerds over making clients feel like they belong and are supposed to be there. Also, their kids might make an appearance. They will take time to answer all of your questions even the uncomfortable ones. They will work relentlessly to make sure your plan's exactly what you need to feel secure and at peace. So if you've been putting off planning for what's going to happen after you've gone, it's time for you to give Tallgrass a call at 918-770-8940 and start your plan today. Or visit their website at tallgrassestateplanning.com and schedule a free initial consultation. For free! It's right there on the website. And of course, there's more, because this is a podcast ad. If you tell them you're a Pod for Good listener, they're going to take 25% off their service fees. Just tell them Pod for Good sent you. Stop thinking estate planning isn't for you, and give Tallgrass a call today at 918-770-8940, or on their website, which I'm not going to read out to you again. It's in our show notes. Thank you, Tallgrass. Welcome to another episode of Pod for Good, a podcast where we learn from those doing good in Tulsa, why they care, what we can do, and most importantly, what you can do. Pod for Good is produced and edited by Rant9 Productions, which is me. So if you like how we sound and are thinking about starting a podcast, please reach out to me. I am very easy to find. Pod for Good can be found anywhere you get your podcasts. And please, if you enjoy Chris and I's little shtick, please subscribe anywhere you get your podcasts. I am today, tomorrow, and always. Chief Philanthropod and Class Clown for Justice, one gazillion, Jesse Ulrich. And I am your Vice Admiral Philanthropod and Alpha and Omega Class Clown for Justice, Chris Miller. And today, our interview is with Dan Devey, the founder and executive director of Gays in Space. We talked to Dan about Gays in Space, the importance of seeing ourselves in sci-fi and how the meaning of progress has shifted over time. Enjoy. We are very excited to have Dan from Gaze in Space on the podcast uh, today. Dan, how you doing? I'm doing really well. How are you guys? Well, I'm doing great. Chris, how are you doing today? I mean, I'm doing all right. I mean, uh, I, I'm going to be sniffling a lot uh, for our listeners. I... Had sinus surgery last week, and so had basically um, two giant straws and two tampons pulled out of my nose earlier today. Um, so I'm feeling a lot better than I was when those were in my nose. That's that's for sure. Dan, tell us about the amazing organization that is Gaze in Space. Absolutely. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me on. When uh, I got your email, I thought this is this is fantastic because your email said. You know, we want to have people on the show who are doing social good. And you said, and that's definitely what Gaze in Space is doing. And to hear that, you know, whenever I hear that, it's such a it 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 gives me such a boost because especially, you know, during the two years uh, with the pandemic, so much of what I do is sitting at my computer and there's no like back and forth and Sometimes you feel like you're doing all this work and you wonder, does anyone care? You know, am I am I really making a difference or am I just talking to hear myself talk? So when I got your email, I just thought that was that was really nice of you to say. And uh, I thought, of course, like I have to come on, do this podcast. And um, yeah. And, and thank you for that. So Gaze in Space started in August of 2016. And it's interesting, it was, I created it because I had been working on a documentary uh, asking the question, why are there no gay people in Star Trek? You know, every other minority group has been represented in Star Trek showing us that they make it into the future. They, they're still there, they're respected, they are equals. Um, and, but, but the gay community is the only group that wasn't a part of that. 
So I started interviewing a bunch of the Star Trek actors and just asked the question to see, well, what do they think? And I was getting some really good stuff. And then in 2016, Star Trek Beyond came out. Suddenly, Sulu was gay with a husband and a daughter, and my doc was out the window. So I thought, okay, all right, Dan, Dan, (laughs) bigger picture, bigger picture. It's okay. It's okay. (laughs) This is much more important. So I decided, you know what? Um, I'm going to throw a party to celebrate this fact because I found it very strange that this happened. You know, over 50 years, we've been waiting to see this. Even though on screen, it was three seconds. I mean, if you blinked, you missed it. But it's something that I know I've personally waited for. I've been a Star Trek fan since I was like seven or eight. And, you know, I've waited for this. And I thought, what, no fanfare? No parties? Nobody is commemorating this, like, historic thing? So I was going to be at Star Trek Las Vegas that year, covering it as uh, a member of the press. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to throw a party just to commemorate this. It may be me and three other friends, you know, raising a toast to the moment, but that's fine. I have to do something. And it ended up being like a really big success. It turned out that a lot of people cared as much as I did. I had asked Nana Visitor, who plays Major Kira on Deep Space Nine, if she would come to the party. And she said to me, she was like, Dan, I can come, but I can probably only stay for like 20 minutes. And I said, that's amazing. Like just having you there will mean so much to us. She stayed for three and a half hours (laughs) and like had to put her in a car, send her back to the hotel because she had photo ops at like 9 (laughs) a.m. She just had she had such an amazing time that the following day she found me and she said, Dan, Whenever you do that again, I'm there. You just tell me when and where, and I am there. And I thought, oh, crap, I guess this is what I do now. <laughs> because if Nina Visitor says she's going to come to a party I'm going to plan, if I plan these parties, you bet your ass I'm going to start planning these parties. And so it's it, it really just snowballed. And we're here now. It's been um, going on uh, six years now. We've done, you know, well over 100 events, 150 or so all across the country. We've been on Star Trek The Cruise. We've done a bunch of conventions during the pandemic. Uh, we adapted and started doing virtual celebrations uh, before the big guys did. Not that I'm saying, you know, of course, everybody was going to get to that eventually, but we were one of the first to do that. Um, And we did a ton of those. We've had 60 plus of the actors come to our events and support us. And it's been, I mean, it's been shocking to me and so incredible for so many reasons, I never would have seen it coming. Never. It was supposed to be a one-off party, and it's become my my career. It's become my <laughs> life, and it's the reason that I have all the friends that I have today, the people that I'm closest to. I met because of Gaze in Space. My fiance, I met because of Gaze in Space. Like, this organization has done so much, and we're not the first. There were two other gay couples who met at a gays in space party and got married. <laughs> so I was just, yeah, it floors me sometimes to think of the impact that we've been able to have and continue to have. And that, you know, you guys, people like you, you see it, you respond to it. And uh, yeah, it's just been that's kind of been the journey so far. Star Trek and sci fi in general, you know, dreams normal. I mean, it, it's kind of shifted to more like dystopian futures now, but there was always a sense like, and I saw on your website that you also mentioned The Expanse, right? Which also has tons of great LGBTQ representation where like no one gives a shit. Like how many exactly. how many partners you have, what their genders are. It's, and, and the, the newer Star Treks have certainly, I think, embraced that more than obviously the shows made in the 90s when, you know, a woman kissing a woman was a big deal in one episode. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, so in, in, in those six years, what have you seen as far as like sci-fi in general? And it's, you know, discussing the probable future of all this, all these sorts of issues. It's interesting. That episode you mentioned where it, it, it was the first same sex kiss on Star Trek that was on Deep Space Nine. And there was there was the second 
same sex kiss was also Deep Space Nine we're between two that. different characters. Ah, you've got it right there. Oh, well, nice. We'll about Very nice. Both Nana and Terry Farrell, who uh, Terry Farrell played Dax, she was in the first same sex kiss. And they tell the story of the day they walked on to film it, the set was packed with people. She had, they had to like work their way through and get, you know, and Nana particularly said, I wonder what's going on. What is the, and they were all there to witness the girl on girl kiss, which really blew my mind when I heard that because yes, it was the late nineties, but there was internet. There was plenty of porn available. If you wanted to see two ladies kiss, you could find a lot of places. But the fact that it was on Star Trek, people, you know, and these are professionals in the entertainment industry, like losing their shit over the fact that two women were kissing. And the actors thought, what is the big deal? It's insane that this is such a big deal. So going from that, to where we are today with Star Trek Discovery, Star Trek Discovery has done more for the advancement of LGBTQIA plus individuals than I believe any other show or movie, you know, has ever done. The only thing that I can uh, compare it to is when Will and Grace first came on air. The president told the cast of Will and Grace that you did more for the for the the gay rights movement than I ever could. Um, and I, I believe that because it was the first time everyone in America, including middle America, got to know gay characters and realized that like, oh, crap, they're just people, huh? That's very similar to what Star Trek Discovery is doing for the world today, because you have not only your first original gay character you we they began with a couple so it was two gay characters in a committed relationship and nothing about it was in your face different it was just that was one of the relationships you know on the show and i it's my suspicion now i have nothing to back this up with other than the fact that i think it um the studio i think when they came up with the idea for the show, said, all right, we're going to have to have some gays in this one. Otherwise, they're not going to shut up and they're going to bitch. So, like, we have to have some gays. So they put them in. I do not believe they thought anyone was really going to connect with the characters or really care. I mean, because in that same show, you had your first woman of color lead for the show. Sonequa Martin-Green was the lead of the show. And somehow the gay relationship ended up overshadowing even that. So at the end of the season, spoiler if anybody hasn't seen it, but it's like five years old now, um, they kill off one of the gay guys. And everybody got so angry because it's like, right, of course, if you're going to tell a gay story, it has to end tragically. So they came up with a weird way to bring them back the next season. So one, one thing I think that is kind of interesting is, is you have this group of people largely on the internet, some of them elected officials, who seem to think that having science fiction be on some of the for forefront of representation and stuff like that is some sort of brand new phenomena. And while obviously where science fiction is now is is light years, no pun intended, to, uh, <laughs> head of where it was in prior decades, it seems that science fiction has always tried to be a little bit more on the leading edge when it comes to social exploring social issues and uh, representation than many other genres. But it also seems like some people look at it and think of it as some sort of new woke uh, version of science fiction. So what, what do you see um, with that? And how do you, how do you respond to those type of comments? It's so interesting because the first time I heard it, I was concerned. But after like the 10th time I heard it, I just laugh. When people who claim to be Star Trek fans say things like, Star Trek shouldn't be political. Star Trek is too woke. Star and it's just like, have you ever 
scene of the show. Yeah. Like, that's why Star Trek has endured for more than half a century. You know, the original series, the guy half black, half white, the studio execs didn't get it. And apparently these people also didn't get it. (laughs) But it was an incredibly powerful statement about race relations in this country. You know, the fact that, you know, a woman of color was on the bridge, that there, you know, was an Asian um, helmsman, there was a Russian, you know, there was, a, you know, a Scottish guy. There, it was such a collection of all different types of humanity, and no one was seen as inferior. No one was judged based on how they looked or what their background was. So that's what Star Trek does. And anyone who thinks that's a new thing needs to go back and maybe, maybe try to find a smarter friend to sit down (laughs) and watch it with you so that they can point out to you the moments where it is pushing the boundaries. It is pushing, you know, I mean, Whoopi Goldberg tells the story where if Nichelle Nichols had not been Uhura on Star Trek, she never would have become Whoopi Goldberg. She saw her on television and it was the first time she saw a true, uh, genuine, respectful representation of someone who looked like her, you know, and and, and a respected, brilliant officer on a starship. And she said from that moment on, she knew she could do anything. Without that inspiration, she said, I wouldn't be who I am. And that's what makes the inclusion of gay characters so incredibly important. You know, a lot of people don't realize, well, many people don't realize, particularly if you're, you know, a cisgendered white person, you know, like, yeah, because, and we wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily expect someone to because it's not your experience. You have always seen yourselves represented in media, but for those of us who haven't seen ourselves, there is, it's a very disheartening experience to know that your favorite pieces of entertainment, like for me, growing up, loving Star Trek, I mean, not only loving it, I have lived my life by the Roddenberry philosophy. And to realize that all that time I spent loving something that was telling me that I didn't exist was, how do you come to terms with that? It's a very bizarre uh, place to be. So the fact that trans kids, non-binary kids, everyone under, you know, everyone under the umbrella, the fact that not only do they see characters on screen like themselves, they're being played by actors who are also like them. And it really cannot be overestimated how much that means, particularly to kids. Adults, we, you know, it means a lot to us too, but for kids growing up and being able to see that, I I mean, I'm telling you, we are going to end up with some absolutely amazing scientists and astronauts and physicists and all sorts of incredible professions like that because of the influence that Star Trek has had, letting letting kids know, yeah, you can do this. You can absolutely do this. You can be whatever you want to be. I feel like the people who accuse Star Trek of like being woke now and not realizing what Star Trek actually is are the same people who like root for the Empire in Star Wars, <laughs> right? There's that branch of people. Like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> like, well, they're trying to keep law and order. I'm like, yeah, but... Are they? Like, come on. <laughs> there are so many things that you brought up that I want to talk about. I'm trying to figure out which one is the most interesting to move to next. But I mean, well, I, I always think it's fascinating. I mean, how do you convince somebody or does it even matter to that representation is important to somebody who has always been represented? Like, how do you make that feel that point feel real? You know, I mean, we've it's some it's something that has come up a lot, not just in. In, in other interviews we've done, not even just in like entertainment, while well, that's important, but um, we had a doctor on um, who would go to the schools that he grew up in so that people that looked like him could see a doctor because most of the doctors that those kids would see would be white. 
So, you know, he was able, he talked to us about how important it was to those kids to see there's somebody who came where I came from, looks like I look and was successful. But to somebody like me, who, like you said, has always been represented, how do you make them realize how important it is? That's a really, really interesting question and uh, a great important question to ask. I feel like you guys are better qualified to answer that than I am because just because growing up you saw yourselves reflected in you know the majority and all of that stuff does not mean that you didn't feel like an outsider in some respect i don't believe anyone regardless of your circumstance who you know where you were born what family you were born into i don't think there's a single person who has not felt completely alone, alienated, and other at some point in their lives. You could be in a, in a school, you know, in a classroom full of nothing but whiter than white, white bread, privileged children. And I guarantee there will be those among them that are picked on for whatever the reason is. So I, I think it's kind of up to you guys to remember back to whatever that was for you and see if there is kind of a, a correlation. Um, and I'm curious, what what do you guys think? I mean, both Jesse and I had kind of the same experience. We grew up in a in a suburb that was mostly white, largely uh, evangelical Protestant. And I was raised Catholic. Jesse's Jewish. And so it wasn't unusual for us to both be told we were going to hell and, you know, we were sacrificing babies and whatnot, et cetera. You know, et cetera. Um, so it's the type of thing where, you know, on a small level, I think that we can understand a little bit, but even in that, one of the things that Jesse and I have learned is that as any type of, I don't even want to use the word oppression, but any type of othering that we felt, we also know at the same time that it is nowhere near what others experience, right? That, that a lot of the other things about us insulate the fact that, that we are white men, it insulates us from any of the other othering that we might feel. So yeah, we both growing up at times would felt like outsiders, you know, felt like the weird kids. Uh, you know, we both have had weight trouble our entire lives. So we felt moments of that, but you know, we could also escape into fantasy and sci-fi and we could see, you know, a nerdy fat kid who is an outsider that then becomes a hero. You know, we could we could see stuff like that, right? We could see people like us overcoming, which is something that helped us, right? And that's something that, you know, I know that that there has been more representation in literature for a lot longer than there has been in TV and movies, but it it I I mean from that respect, I can I can understand why representation matters because I could find somebody who looked like me that was overcoming some of the problems that I had and becoming a hero or becoming a success. And I can see why that would be meaningful to somebody else. I like just to add to that, like, like, yes, to everything Chris said, but like also as a as a Jewish person, an even smaller minority in Broken Arrow, like and as a large part of my like outgoing identity, it was always weird that like, yeah, the person on screen looked like me but they were not of me, right? There's not a lot of, especially, you know, like Jews normally like sci-fi over fantasy because in the future, like we seem to fix some things as far as hatred and whatnot is concerned. But like every time I was reading The Expanse and they talk about how they just saw like the SS Beth Israel go by, I'm like, I would always cheer. Like it made me happy. It's like, hey, <laughs> Jews in the future, right? And Star Trek's Jesse, there's not. representation in fantasy. Just uh, look at Harry Potter and the uh, yeah, banks and the, and the, goblins. And the goblins. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't just a mistake, as we've learned from yeah. her. But anywho, um, <laughs> sorry. But sorry. no, I mean it's like yeah, not all representation is good. Just yeah, <laughs> just to that, point that's that also out. true. That's also true. But you know, like growing up in a very white place and then watching DS Nine in, in the nineties, like I don't have the same stereotypes as other white people do because I saw a black captain who was a great father to his son. Right. So the 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 literal even thing, if his son was annoying and maybe didn't. Yes. Deserve yeah. It. Like, why is he even there, Jake? Um, <laughs> it's like you're gonna be a reporter. Come on, dude. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Ugh, still angry. Sorry, there's a lot of but, Jake slander on this podcast. Yeah, yeah. We have two friends named Jake. But like Avery Brooks was very, very keen on the fact that he wanted to show like a healthy father relationship. He's like, people are going to see me 
as a as the as a representative of, of all black people and i'm not going to be you know all of the stereotypes that exist for black fathers and with like they they rewrote the ending of the show for that like he didn't want to look like he was abandoning him his, his wife and daughter right and so those things just sort of you realize later those things just seep into you and dictate how you see the world and so to prove to, to, to other white people i would say if you saw this when you were younger you would realize why representation is important and if you could go back if we could like retint old movies and make everybody black instead of white then white people could then fully see what it feels like to not be represented in media yeah so. exactly and so there i mean there's your answer all all you have to do is is think back to the moment when you felt that and then multiply it by like a thousand. And if you cannot empathize at that point, then it's like just just pack it up and never watch Star Trek again. Like just just go. And the other the other side effect of that representation is the fact that other people are seeing this and are realizing, you know, like I said about Will and Grace, people real, oh, wow, gay people are just people, you know? And one of the things that I try to mention whenever I talk about this is part of, part of the assertion and realization that gay people are just people is that some gay people are assholes. Like, mm -hmm. just because you're gay, just because you're a member of uh, a minority group or an underrepresented group doesn't make you a saint. So uh, I want to give straight people permission to judge gay people based on their personalities, how they act, how they treat you, what they're contributing to the world. You don't have to pretend to like us if you think we're assholes <laughs> because a we can be, which is not exactly an intuitive thing for someone who started a a gay, you know, rights kind of organization. But I think that's important because it's part of, it's part of the leveling of the playing field. Oftentimes I find that people get caught up in, uh, and this idea of who suffers more, who has had it worse. And it's like, this is not the disenfranchisement, like Olympics, like, it, it, no, no. We are, it's not a competition for who is more oppressed. It is, okay, I have my issues that hurt a lot. You have yours. What has caused them can be radically different, but the effect is the same, which is hurt. And that's what we want to be able to alleviate. And the way that happens is, I mean, the first way that it happens is that people watch television, they watch movies, they, they read books. Even if you live in an area that is predominantly one type of person, you can always go to media to see how big the world actually is and how diverse it is. And for me, whenever I'm in a place or a situation where everyone is white, I get super nervous and super uncomfortable. And I mean, I'm 100% Irish. So I am as white as if it wasn't for the fact that I was gay, I'd be exactly like you guys, I would be in the same boat, but the gay gives me the uh, the extra card there. But because growing up, I grew up on Staten Island, which is a borough of New York. And my older sister used to try to mock me, even though it ended up she was really complimenting me. She used to call my group of friends the United Nations because my friends were typically like the one Asian kid, the one Puerto Rican kid, the one. And it was what I gravitated towards. I grab it. And as soon as I could, I moved the hell off Staten Island and moved into Manhattan where, you know, I am generally in the minority because there is such uh, a diverse collection of people in Manhattan anywhere you go. But when I go other places, I've driven cross country several times and I will end up in a place probably similar to where you guys are. And uh, I would drive faster to like kind of, you know, cornfields and no one's around to hear you scream. It makes me very Texas Chainsaw Massacre terrified. 
That's how I also feel driving through those parts. I'm like, I know, right? Yeah. Having representation does not take away from mm-hmm. all the other actors in the show, most of whom are white. Yeah, so, exactly. Or the writers or the directors. Or Well, and the, a point yeah. that you brought up that I hadn't really thought about is that this is supposed to be the future, right? Having groups not there is, is basically implying that that group didn't make it, yeah. right? So, so not having somebody there is saying this group of people doesn't exist anymore. And so it's almost more important to have representation in those situations than it is if it's a modern, you know, a show in, in our, in current times. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, what's interesting is that you just touched on the real reason that gays in space has continued for as long as it has. I said earlier, you know, just kind of sillily that it was because I wanted a not visitor to come to parties that I threw, but the the real answer as to why Gaze in Space has continued was at the second event that we did in New York City, Rod Roddenberry came to it. He's Gene Roddenberry, who created Star Trek, his son. And he came to the event and had a blast. And at the end of it, uh, he said to me, he was like, Dan, let me buy you a drink. And because I had, as the host, it was like, you know, celebrities come, you make sure they don't have to pay for anything, you get them drinks. And if they enjoy the alcohol, you give them as much as they like, they have a wonderful time. And so I, I said, great. And we sat down and we started talking. And I asked him the question, why no gay, why do you think there were no gay people in Star Trek? And he said, and he was, this was when we were just getting to know each other. So he was very cautious about this. He said, I've heard certain people say, not me, this is not my opinion, I'm not saying this, but over the years, certain people who are not me, I'm telling you, Dan, it's not me. I was like, okay, just say it. Certain people over the years, when asked that question, theorized that the reason there are no gay people in Star Trek is because it's been cured by then. Yeah. And... You feel that? You feel that, like, pit that you feel in your stomach right now, having heard that? That's exactly how it hit me that first time. And the more that I thought about it, the more terrifying it became. Because if you assume that, if, if you were to assume that their initial supposition, that being gay is something wrong, is something that is not supposed to be, If you believe that, then it is a completely plausible explanation as to why you've never seen a gay person on Star Trek. And the fact that Trek did anything that could be construed to have that message attached to it was terrifying to me. I mean, they 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 drew the analogy. They were like, well, come on, nobody's got cancer anymore either. (laughs) So it was that moment honestly, when I said, okay, this needs to, this needs to continue because people, people can't think that I will not allow it. I will not permit it. It will not pass that anyone would ever think that again. So at that point I said, you know what, not only is this what I do from now on, this is what I was meant to do my, my whole life. I mean, I spent 20 years as an entertainment journalist and that was fine. But this is what I was meant to do. And yeah, it all started with that heart wrenching kick in the nuts statement that just continue. Every time I say it, I feel it in the pit of my stomach. So yeah, to bring everything down to a serious note. Sorry about that. What is viewed as progress at a certain time changes? Like, so what was progress in the 60s is not what we consider progress now, right? So even if some original Star Trek writers or Gene Rombard himself, thought we could cure gayness like that doesn't take away from like the fact that the next generation had an episode where they ran to people who had no gender there was a genderless society right and that like that had a big effect on me i'm like it never occurred to me before i saw that episode that like gender couldn't exist or that it was a a spectrum where there was a sort of a a neutral zone as, as it were and and like the progress of you know again like next generation very white right except for Worf and Jordy right? Yeah. Who are not in charge. The progress of Star Trek itself changes and improves over time. Like there was mm-hmm. a, uh, Discovery has a trans actor playing a gay character, right? And, yep. and a I, non-binary I, actor playing a non-binary character. Yeah. 
Which, w- when you were first talking about gays on Discovery, that's who I thought you were talking about. I totally, literally had forgotten about the original gay couple of Discovery. Mm-hmm. Um, is it, oh my God, isn't that great? Yes. I love the fact that there are times when we're discussing the issues of our community and it's like the the white, just plain old regular gay dude. We are, just, we're like, you and I, we're basically on the same level now. Like as far <laughs> as, you know, as far as immediate social issues that need to be addressed, that are, that there is no way around. I mean, the level of violence being committed against the trans community, particularly the trans community of color, is horrific. Is mm-hmm. absolutely horrific. And that is that is an issue that needs to be addressed immediately. The fact that someone may look at me funny when I walk through, you know, an airport in Texas wearing my big, proud, gaze in space, live long and be fabulous t-shirt is not what should be at the top of the agenda. Yes, it it, it sucks that that still happens. Although between us, I love doing that. <laughs> I love walking around places wearing that big thing with a big sign. And because, you know, I get I get one of two reactions uh, and they they both involve double takes and the double take happens and it either results in a smile or a sneer, a smile with a little chuckle. And because, again, like you wouldn't necessarily, you know, I'm walking through an airport, you wouldn't necessarily pick me out and be like, oh, there's one of them gays. So, and when I when I talk, I'm, I'm not what a lot of people expect a stereotypical gay guy to sound like. So the fact that I'm there, you know, just being myself, but I am labeling myself like soups gay. It, you know, the people that it throws for a loop deserve to be thrown for a loop. <laughs> Yeah. And the ones who get a chuckle out of it or a smile are that I love when that when that happens. But I mean, Jesse, you're wearing that very shirt right now. I wear it all around town. I love it. Can you wear it in Oklahoma? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, that's the thing. We're in a yeah. bit of a at least in the circles we run in and the part of Tulsa we live in. We're in a bit of a bubble. I mean, it's it's it's. It's also like a lot of cities in the South and the Midwest, or at least this part of it, that it's sort of like a blue center that just gets progressively redder and redder and redder. So if you are in and around the city center, if you're, you know, like I said, in the circles that we are, there's other than an occasional confused look, right? We're not going to get a lot of pushback for it. But yeah, there are certainly places that if we drove an, uh, 10 to 15 minutes further, we might got, get a little bit more than just uh, uh, a confused look. That's the thing, uh, like, representation and time have made, especially, uh, I'd, I'd say gay men especially, less scary to someone who doesn't know a gay man. But And now all that anger and confusion has transferred onto trans people. Mm-hmm. And it's a much more complicated conversation to have about with, with someone. And people don't like being unsure, right? And I've, I've noticed that like people will instantly turn to anger when they feel like they're wrong and don't know why they're wrong. And they'll just dig in on that instead of like, you know, th- yeah. working it out for themselves. And, you know, we're about to have a lot of uh, abortion discussions in this country. And that's going to that's going to hear a lot of a lot of dudes talking about women's bodies in ways that proves they have no idea how they work mm-hmm. yeah. or what's happening. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And yeah. It the fear of your own ignorance is something that is going to hold people back their entire lives. Anyone who's listening now who doesn't who doesn't know what it means to be gay, who doesn't understand what what is a trans person? What, what is uh, what's the difference between gender identity and sexuality? What, if you are too afraid to learn what the answers are to the questions that you very rightly and justly have, if it's not your experience, then there is no reason in the world why you would know these details. I mean, it has only been within the last maybe three years or so, and because of Gays in Space, that I have started to learn about 
the trans community and the non-binary community and, you know, all the other parts of this community that are not just plain old regular gay guys. And the way that I've done that, I've asked questions. I've admitted, look, I don't know the answer to this, but I want to. I want to understand. I don't want to be ignorant in this circumstance. Anyone who is too afraid to do that, I'm very sorry. Your life is going to be so incredibly limited and full of negativity that I'm just kind of sad for you because there's no need for that. Just because you don't know something, that is not an indictment of you as a person. It's a representation of your surroundings, your, your situation, and your circumstances, and there's nothing wrong with that. The problem is when you go immediately to anger, and I don't understand, so it must be bad because I don't want to learn because if I say I don't know, then I'm weak, and I have to take a stand because, you know, God forbid someone in this country hear an issue and think, let me think about that. What do you think? <laughs> yeah. What do you think? Maybe if we come together and let, hmm, maybe put together a little bit of what you said and maybe a little bit of what I said. Let's let's see. God forbid that happens. You know? Yeah. God. The whole flip flopping thing. Do you guys remember during the if, if it was really it was John in, Kerry. John it was John Kerry. Kerry right? Yeah. John Kerry. Yeah. And he got oh, swift voted. He yeah. flip flops. It's like wait. You mean he he, he has learns a new information idea? and changes yeah. his mind? God, what? They made that a bad thing. How? How did we allow that? <laughs> no, I know. Uh, oh God. Yeah. yeah. Mind boggling. No, it's 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 fascinating to see. I mean, even in like my regular work environment, having to train people to 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 learn that it is okay, even if you're dealing with an important, powerful person, to say, I don't know the answer to that question. I will try to figure it out. That that is always a better answer than giving a wrong answer just so you can say something. And I feel like most of this country has forgotten that. That yeah. they're like, well, I'm better off saying nonsense than saying nothing right now. Yeah. What What's the old expression? Uh, better to better to remain silent and appear ignorant than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, considering the internet, right? If I mean, especially like in the work I do in audio and video production, right? If I don't know something, I literally Google it, and there's a YouTube video that shows me how to do it, right? <laughs> and so I, I naturally now people ask me questions. I'm like, I don't know. I'll look that up. I'm like, I'm not gonna try to pretend that I know. If I don't, I'll be like, I can find out though. I can learn new yeah. skills very quickly, which is yeah. good. Yeah, like, right? isn't, it a, isn't it amazing that the internet is the sum of all human knowledge at our fingertips, and yet it is most known for uh, Twitter and spreading hate and anger and lies and adjusting elections in countries? And it's just like, hey, everybody, it's the sum of all human knowledge at your fingertips. <laughs> Why are we getting dumber? Why has the existence of that made people dumber? You know, I, I always think of it as, you know, those episodes of Star Trek where they would go to a, a less evolved planet and someone would argue like, well, you, you have replicators. These people don't have that. Just give them the technology. And, they, and they're like, no, that's not how it works. You have to get to a certain point and uh, get to it on your own because in that process, a lot of things change. I feel like the internet came to us way too soon. We have so much growing up to do as a species that developing the internet came too soon. And if at some point we find out that we got the internet because aliens landed here <laughs> and, you know, they, they left some shit behind and somebody was like, oh, this could be this, you know, th this will be great for porn. Let's do it. If that turns out to have been the case, I will not be shocked because <laughs> the minds that created the internet, you know, it is staggering how brilliant people are. But when you put that that small group of brilliant people next to the masses, uh, it's we were not socially ready, I believe, because if we were, the Internet wouldn't be used to spread hate, lies and fear. The Internet would be used to spread knowledge and mm -hmm. to educate people and to expand the horizons of all of humanity. The internet is all people and not, and not all people are great. So yeah. th they're going to be there. Right. So there are both bright spots 
and very, very dark spots. 8chan, <laughs> I'm looking at you, and 4chan. I'm looking at you on oh. some dark places uh, where, where people can be anonymous. I, I, I truly feel like, um, uh, especially on message boards where people can, where you don't know what their actual names are. People mm. will say stupid things. Uh, one, just to, you know, troll other people, but two, because they feel like it's never going to come back on them. So yeah, it's, it's incredible. It, it, this is another thing that's been incredible to me over these six years is that, you know, we have, we have positively impacted the lives of so many people, like, you know, thousands and thousands of people we've met and interacted with and, you know, have left with new friends and a new perspective. And it's been super positive. But as with anything, we have acquired, you know, our little group of haters. And it is amazing what they will say on the internet and how quickly they shut up when I'm standing in front of them. And it is because that's the other thing about the Star Trek community. It's small. Yes, a lot of people like Star Trek, but there's the big Vegas event. There's the big cruise event. So uh, you're going to see the people that are involved in that community at some point. And it it just it boggles my mind to think because it's something I would never do. I would never write something that I wouldn't also say to someone's face. I just wouldn't. I mean, it's communication. The fact that people can think you get a free pass because it's written and and not verbal, it's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> if you have criticisms, that is totally fine. But have the same criticisms when you see me face to face. Sorry, that was a little militant. No, 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 no it's, it's good. It's, <laughs> yeah. But so I, I'd like to bring it back to the positive, to the happy. There you um, go. By by asking you, Jesse, you've been to Gaze in Space events and occasionally this doesn't happen as much anymore, but we do occasionally uh, get questions from people saying, like, I'm not gay, but can I still come to the event? And you, we're like, of course. Oh, my God. Yes, please. That's why we do these. And we've been so fortunate because generally our audience is split down the middle between you know, it's like 50% gay, 50% non-gay. And people get together and have, have a great time. As a straight guy coming to Gays in Space events, I wonder if you could kind of describe to people who are listening now what the experience is like and what they would experience if they were to come to one. I went to your uh, boozy, boozy bingo, right? And just looking around the room, I could sort of kind of tell like it was at least half and half. And mm -hmm. one, like I, I knew it was going to be fun and welcoming because it was an event that you, an inclusive organization was putting on. Like, of course you want non-gay people there. They're the ones who need to learn that it, gay people are cool and like, don't be afraid of them. <laughs> um, and also like one, I mean, apparently both Star Trek fans and the actors and writers of the show love booze. So we had a lot of booze there, but it was, it was bingo. Like literally the oldest, like, board game thing you could do with a group of people is bingo, right? It has the, you know, the stereotype of bingo players are all old people. And, and it was just fun and delightful is really the word I would use. It was great. Mm -hmm. Like it was bingo with a fun group of people. It didn't matter, really matter who they were or why they, it, it, in, you know, allowed us to come. It was just, I knew it was going to be a open, like welcome, fun space. Cool. And, and it was, you know, aside from the banners that we put up, with, you know, gays in space, there was really nothing gay about bingo. No. Like it was, I mean, I dorked out Trek wise more than I generally do on that because every time I called a new, num a new number, I tried to think of a Star Trek thing to put with it. You know, <laughs> you know, B12, Borg 12, B13, Betazoid 13. And I was just, and then, you know, by the end, like audience members were shouting out new things. So it, yeah, it, yes, it's a gaze in space event, but there was really very little gay about that. And then when we did, uh, Jesse, did you see Trekkie Feud? Yes. Yes, I did. That was great. That, that was also great. Oh my God. That was, I think, my favorite event that we've we've ever done. That specific hosting Trekkie Feud for me is the happiest 
I can ever be because I was apparently a 70s game show host in a previous <laughs> life because I never feel as at home as I do when I'm hosting Trekkie View. And Ciroc Lofton, who plays Jake Sisko. Very, cool, was very cool guy. Super cool guy. Very tall. He, yeah, right? And handsome. Hmm. Jake grew up. Up. <laughs> so he was one of our celebrity team captains, and he had just come from the Squares uh, event, Star Trek Squares. He told me when we got to the end of the event, he was like, Dan, you realize there were more people trying to get into feud than were at Squares. And Squares was the cruise's biggest game show event in the massive theater. And then other people said, oh man, I tried to get in, but there wasn't room. I couldn't get into the room, like standing room only. And it was just like, my mind was blown. And yeah, there are a lot of gay people on that cruise, but that room, I guess was 75% non-gay. It's just that it's a fun event that Trekkies really enjoy. So people show up for it and, you know, sexuality, gender is all, it, it's just not important. It, it, is, is, is that where Jake lost because he couldn't remember the name of his DS9 mother? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah. 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 That was hilarious. Oh, uh, that, oh my God. That was so good. Oh. Uh, yeah. Her name's Jennifer, by the way, uh, Ciroc. <laughs> um, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I was definitely in that room. Yeah, it was, it was crowded in there. And, you know, like, I mean, it's a cruise. So, like, even as cool as the, uh, the idea of a Star Trek cruise is, like, the side events were much more fun. Yeah. And, and most Agreed. of those events were yours. And they were great because if we can stereotype people, I would say one stereotype, I feel like it's true, is that gay people put on great parties. Yeah. Get, yeah. Get, Unless... Unless you're one of the assholes within the yes, gay community. Yeah. So, in which case, you put nice in no effort. Nice gay people and, put on yeah. great parties. There you I'm, go. I've yes. never been to a, an asshole gay party yet. Well, that, <laughs> that's going to sound strange. Um, Ooh, how much more time do we have? <laughs> you opened quite a door there, sir. I did. I could say I opened up a wormhole, for example. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. All right. All right. Um, on that note. We yeah, are, like, we're, we're getting, we're getting a little long here. This has been a lot of fun, but why don't you tell us what's, what's next for Gaze in Space? Absolutely. So we are doing a live Trekkie feud in LA next week, May the 11th in West Hollywood. And we're doing a few episodes of uh, a podcast called On the Rocks hosted by Alexander Rodriguez. It's a really, it's a great podcast, fun uh, Denise Crosby and I are doing it uh, one night. Issa Briones from Picard is coming in and a few other Star Trek actors. So we're going to be doing that in the later part of the week. And Star Trek Vegas, that's the big thing that's coming up for the first time. I've been doing it for the last like, you know, five years, six years. And before that, I did it as press for like another four or five. This year is the first time I've been added as an official guest on right. Creations website. Nice. So I was super jazzed about that. We will be there. We'll be doing parties literally every night. We will have a booth on the floor. We'll be hosting Trekkie Feud. Uh, we're going to be doing a panel called Gaze in Actual Space. <laughs> Connecting the science with science fiction, which is really where our focus is now. There will be people from NASA there, astronauts, like it, it's going to be crazy. So uh, that's the next big thing that we are super excited for. And uh, before we started, you you mentioned that you're about to have a new run of merch as well. Yes. Yes. So we are going to be printing more Live Long and Be Fabulous t-shirts. And last time we printed red ones. Because prior to those red ones, we had done one blue, but other than that, everything was a black t-shirt. And the gays in space who have been there from the beginning were like, Dan, there are other colors, man. <laughs> Can you please do something other than that? Um, and Nathan, who is one of like our main gays in space, he and I did cosplay as Boimler, where we put on the purple wig and we painted our eyebrows purple. And we realized purple makes our eyes pop. So we were like, next T-shirt, going to be purple to make our <laughs> eyes pop. Um, so, yeah, that, that's next up. And you can find that uh, our website is Gaze in Space, 3 A's in Gaze, 3 A's in Space dot org. And we are on all the social medias uh, at 
gays in space, three A's in gays, three A's in space. But that's just like us putting a four in pod for good, thinking it's a brilliant marketing idea and then realizing you have to say it every time now because, <laughs> um, yeah. but well, excellent. Um, I ho- hope to see you on the, the next Star Trek cruise because uh, we've decided we like that over Vegas. So I will see you uh, in in LA next year. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, yeah, listeners, like at this point, we've been actually recording for an hour and 20 minutes. I have no idea how long <laughs> this episode's actually going to be when I edit it. But just know, anything I cut out was amazing. So, <laughs> and check out, check out Gaze in Space. Buy their merch. When, whenever their fans come back in stock, those fans are awesome. Like hand fans. Ooh. I should have bought them on the cruise and I didn't. And I regret it to this day. That, that'll be another new thing in Vegas. We're coming up with the next... We have to come up with the next design mm. because we, you know, we want each event that we introduce the fans at to just be where you can get that. Like the cruise was the Wesley Crusher uniform from season one, which Will Wheaton, by the way, uh, loved. His <laughs> wife loved it more. She basically did like a fan dance on Instagram with it. <laughs> and she loved it so much. That's awesome. So, yeah, yeah, definitely a new fan design for Vegas. Did she do like a, the uh, a fan Ahura, exclusive? Yeah, uh, Hora Star Trek Five fan dance. Well, uh, you know, there were there were clothes. She, okay. Yeah, she was wearing um, clothes. Yeah. Star Trek Five, <laughs> not great. Um, anyway, Dan, uh, thank you so much for joining. Thank us. you so much. Awesome. Thank you guys. This was fun. Thanks. Thank you all for listening to our episode with Dan. I want you to know that. This interview went on for a very long time, and I had to edit out quite a bit of hilarious conversation that we might release as little little bonus short episodes if you're interested. And to the Mountain Dew Corporation, There's talk about Dew. Uh, we do. We talk about the Dew. We talk about the Dew hard, but flaming hot Dew, alcohol hard Dew. Yeah, hard Dew. Hard Dew is better. Definitely hard <laughs> Dew. Mountain Dew. If you're listening to us, call it the hard Dew. Anyway, but if you want to support, gaze in space. Please check out their websites. That's three A's in gays, three A's in space. Buy some of their merch. Or if you're in areas where they're doing events, go to them. They're fantastic. And, and, if, you, and if you feel like supporting them, that probably also means you like us. So you can support us by uh, liking us on Facebook, subscribing to this podcast, and all of that good stuff. We also have a Patreon page. Uh, so if you want to join... to make comments. Yes, make comments, give us money, etc. That that is the shortest way of doing the podcast outro thing I'm gonna do. But if you want to uh, join the amazing Joy of Cleveland as a philanthropod on the internet, go to our Patreon page and support us. And if you leave a review, we will read it on air. So no one's taking out some of this offer, which is very disheartening to me because that makes me think no one listens to the end, which I know is true anyway. But like, it'd be nice. Anywho, as always, get done, Tulsa, Broken Arrow. I'm gonna give you a pass this week, but be safe out there. Be nice. 